What is going on YouTube? I am Lamont at Large today with my very special guest, Mary. She's going to give us a tour of the Crown Hill Cemetery here in Indianapolis, Indiana. We're here at John Dillinger's grave, um, Jr. He's um, a very famous uh, bank robber and um, he is a lovely res resident of Crown Hill Cemetery. I, I did a video on him and mm -hmm. I was researching him and I didn't know much about him, but he was looked upon as some kind of a Robin Hood, but he was he far, was he was far from a Robin he was. Hood. Though. They um to the point where Chicago actually uh kinda like didn't rest him. They knew he was there. Yeah. And uh the locals kept him safe until he was uh turned in by a girlfriend. And um yeah. they promised her not to deport her if he if they um turned him in. So he she did and um he was shot outside a movie a uh, movie theater and um and if you <laughs> and if you notice on his stone right there there's chunks there's of... chunks missing that is actually his second stone um his original stone was um in the sorry museum in nashville indiana it's called the john dillinger museum it's no yeah. longer there but that is his second stone yeah people come and they'll chip off uh piece of, of a stone as a souvenir so. and his dad's is chipped up too because they didn't know the difference between john dillinger jr and the dad oh okay yeah so and um another interesting fact about dillinger uh his nephew was wanting him exhumed to prove that that was him in the coffin yeah there was a big brouhaha about uh, all that and did they ever end up exhuming him no they did not let him be exhumed yeah and, and he is probably would you guess the most famous resident by far here probably yes okay all right guys that's uh, john dillinger right there well here lies the body of peter gotten durst born in holland september 29th 1918 i came to america in 1949 and wanted to love this beautiful country and I found out it was corrupt and that there is no opportunity for people who want to do right. So I am gone and may the Lord take my soul. So what's the story behind that? I don't know, but um, it's one of the, more, one of the fam more famous um, markers we have here. I mean, we have lots of beautiful, beautiful markers, but, you know, something about him kind of makes it special. <laughs> oh, well, rest in peace to Peter. Peter uh... Hope he finds what he's looking for. This is our famous Willie Gardner, a famous uh, longtime Globetrotter. Yeah, he played uh, with the Harlem Globetrotters uh, back in the uh, 50s. Uh, he was a multi-talented athlete. He played football. I believe he was also signed uh, to the Boston Red Sox farm system. And uh, after playing with the Globetrotters, he, uh, si he signed a contract to play with the New York Knicks. And... Uh, in the preseason, this man averaged 28 points, 18 rebounds a game, six foot nine forward, a uh, fantastic athlete. However, a heart ailment uh, derailed his basketball career. Uh, he could no longer continue to play in the NBA uh, because of that. And uh, a very beloved son of Indianapolis, uh, known as, uh, what was it, known as Willie Wee Gardner? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a fantastically talented athlete, Mr. Gardner, right here. We're here at Lewis Switzer, and he won the first auto event at the Indianapolis 500. I don't believe it was the 500, but I do believe it was an auto event. <laughs> yeah, and he was, uh, says online, he was a great engineer. His wife, uh, Sophie, she died when she was 45 years old, and uh, he never remarried after that, and he built her this. Um, fantastic looking uh what would you call this a mausoleum or this is a, col a columbarium it's a columbarium okay mm -hmm. all right uh, it's a magnificent structure to say the least
Dixie Lee Davidson, she was about three years old when she died. It just says that she died during some kind of a brain operation. Here lies Reverend Mojo Sanders. He's known for feeding thousands of people on Thanksgiving Day. Um, he is a great man. This is Howard Garns. He is the inventor of Sudoku. He's also a graduate of Arsenal Tech High School. Um, and there you have it. Well, wait a minute now. What is Sudoku? Sudoku is a game of numbers. All right, well, what is it? Um, just a fun little game of numbers. I don't play it, so I can't tell you. I just know. Well, what's the purpose of these numbers? What do you, how do you win this uh, game? It's a puzzle. It's uh, by adding numbers or subtracting, you uh, keep moving forward into the puzzle. I know it's not going well. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, well, she doesn't know, and neither do I. I never heard of that game, but um, it's a... Uh, I've heard Very of the game, famous. but I don't... Yeah, I've heard of the name, but I don't know the actual game. So maybe we have some people in here who are Sudoku players, and uh, this is the man who invented that game. Go Titans! A lively 10-year-old boy, Dennis Michael Daniels of 5125 Boulevard Place, threw himself with wholehearted zest into any project that engaged his intention. Whether it was games, scouting, sports, or even school, Dennis participated with all his energy. Dennis died Tuesday night in St. Vincent's Hospital. He had been in the hospital only a day. Born in St. Louis, Dennis had lived in Indianapolis most of his life. He was a fourth grade people at school, 86. Dennis loved to play football and baseball. His parents, aware that his health had become impaired, had to restrain his activity. He played third base on the Little League baseball team of Orchard School. Dennis was a member of University Park Christian Church. At a school, he was a member of the Cub Scout Pack No. 50. With all his exuberance and fondness for sports and play, Dennis had a deep religious faith. His ambition was to become a minister. His last conscious words were those of the Lord's Prayer. Services will be at 1.30 p.m. Saturday in Flanner and Buchanan Broad Ripple Mortuary with entombment in Crown Hill Cemetery. He is uh, buried, uh, excuse me, entombed here uh, right between his parents, uh, Kenneth and Mabel. Here in Indianapolis, anytime you see the race flag here that represents the last lap at the Indy 500, the winner uh, running lap, um, usually has something to do with 500. So is it a club or is it just somebody yeah. that had something race to do with the race? Race enthusiasts that have worked for the Indianapolis 500. Um, it could be used for any type of racing, but for here it is the 500. This is Ray Lee Katzenberger. Uh, he was enlisted in the United States Army and like many young men, uh, he got the call to serve his country in Vietnam and he was killed in Tan An City along with 11 other of his company. Uh, he was killed uh, via a grenade blast. The shrapnel is what took his life. You have to remember the Gold Star families, and uh, anytime you see a flag or a Gold Star, um, pay them respect and um, let them uh, just remember that they have given the ultimate sacrifice. And he's next to his father. That's Ray Katzenberger. He died uh, about seven years after him. I don't see his mother uh, anywhere, but um, yeah, father and son. If you ever wondered what the sweet smell of... Uh, 
death was is walk through a crypt. Sometimes they're leaky. And yeah, so right now, so you said the smell right now that we're mm -hmm. smelling is the decomposition? Decomposition fluids leaking out of the crypts. Okay, it, it doesn't smell bad to me. It just smells dank and kind of musty in here. And you And you yes. told me that you were here how long ago? Uh, about five years ago when there was a crypt leaking. It was in this building right yep. here? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a bad odor. It just smells like a place that's been closed off for quite some time. Yeah, but that smell of sweetness is a uh, decomp. It's decomposition. Right now, we are in the Heroes of Public Safety section of the cemetery. Um, this cemetery section right here, this is where some uh, law enforcement officers uh, lost their lives in the line of duty. This is the grave of Brianne Rochelle Leith, December 30th, 1995 to April 9th, 2020. She was killed responding to a domestic violence call and... And this lady was only 24 years of age. Uh, she was an Army National Guard. Ever since she was a little girl, she wanted to be a police officer. Uh, her mm -hmm. father was a sheriff's deputy, so she wanted to follow in her family's line of work. And uh, just a very beautiful woman and... Domestic violence calls are the absolute number one most dangerous calls that police respond to. When they get that domestic violence call, uh-oh, because there's plenty of training footage that they've seen of officers losing their lives. And listen, we all fight with our significant other. And I just want to say, when you're fighting and the police come, there's a reason why their weapons are pulled out there's a reason why they might have to point their gun at you because they don't know what they're getting it, themselves involved in and it's like stories of officer lee where you just don't know every day you wake up you kiss your husband you kiss your wife goodbye kiss your kids goodbye you don't know if you're coming back and i often said this in a lot of my videos police ain't messing with you very very dangerous occupation to say the least it's always in our best interest that when we get pulled over by the police whatever the situation might be if we fit if we feel that we didn't do anything wrong or we weren't we were wrong then we, we didn't warrant this you know traffic stop or what have you the police doesn't know who you are but we know who they are because they're in uniform so rest in peace to this young woman tragically cut down in the uh, you know, absolutely. I can't even say the prime of her life because she was so young. So just, hey, the unfortunate times where you have to have run-ins with the police, just, I want you to think about stuff like this. I want you to think about this woman's father has to come visit his daughter at the cemetery for the rest of his life, along with her mother as well and her family. So before we think about this, uh, I hate the police, F the police, F12, all this, all these slogans and nonsense that a lot of these weirdos on social media are saying he wants you to think about officers like this lady right here tragically cut down by uh, another scumbag no good reason that she was just doing her job amen this is officer rod lee bradway with the indianapolis police department uh, he was killed in the line of duty on September 20th, 2013. He originally started his career with the Wayne Township Fire Department. He was a firefighter EMT for about 10 years until he decided uh, that he wanted to switch up careers and join the Indianapolis Police Department. And on that day, September 20th, 2013, he responded to, again, a domestic violence call. When he got to the apartment, he heard a woman screaming and a baby crying. Little did he know what he was getting himself into. And without any kind of hesitation, he kicked in the door, drew his gun. He didn't know that when he kicked in the door that there was a armed suspect that had the gun to that lady and her child. And the man turned around, swung his gun and fired multiple times at Officer Bradway. And when he got hit, he fell. The bullets ripped through his pulmonary aorta. 
And as he lay dying, he had the strength to pull out his weapon and shoot the suspects multiple times, killing him. Uh, however, those uh, mortal wounds to Officer Bradway's body was too much for him to take, and uh, he passed away. Again, guys, I just told you before with the other grave. I just told you. Officers never know what, what involves what's going to happen when they get to a particular call. And raise your hand right now when you're listening to me. Raise your hand if you would kick in a door with your gun. If you hear a woman screaming and, and, and she has a, somebody has a gun on her. Now, we might call the police. But I highly doubt any one of us would go into that situation and risk our lives for another. Officer David Moore, end of watch, January 26, 2011, he was conducting a traffic stop. And little did he know that as he approached the vehicle, that would be the last moments of his life. The man that he pulled over pulled out a gun and shot him multiple times. Now he was wearing a bulletproof vest. However, two of those shots landed in his head and uh, he was taken to the hospital where he was later declared dead. He was an organ donor. So even though he lost his life in the line of duty, him being an organ donor uh, saved the lives of at least a dozen other people. Officer Timothy Jacob Laird, September 17th, 1972 to August 18th, 2004. Officer Laird was responding to a domestic disturbance complaint. When he arrived, a man pulled out a gun and started firing. When backup officers arrived, four officers in total were shot. Officer Laird being the only one who was killed in the line of duty. Uh, it was a man who apparently hadn't taken his anti-psychotic medication and was having a schizophrenic episode. That man also, before officers arrived, uh, murdered his own mother. I want you to really quick like look around mm -hmm. of all these graves right here. Anybody out there who is screaming about defunding the police? Look at all these young men and women who lost their lives. And it's very painfully obvious to see that certain voices emanating defund the police are coming from communities where they need the police the most. I say refund the police. Do not let these men and women's lives go in vain. It's nothing but utter nonsense when I hear these weirdos on TV, on the news, lighting their cities on fire, destroying people's businesses, and you have the nerve to want to scream and call out abolishment of the police department. The police are the only ones that thin line between normal everyday society and utter chaos. Remember that. Next time you, if you're one of those people talking about, oh, F this, F that, guess who you're going to call? Guess who you're going to call when you or a loved one is in need of help? That's right. You're going to call the police just like anybody else. Rest in peace to all these officers. And I will be back uh, again in the, in the near future to do the rest of their graves. Rest in peace, officers. We're here at the National Cemetery inside Crown Cahill. It was started in 1864 to bury our war dead from the Civil War. They have um, Civil War, Korean, and Civil World War II soldiers here. Um, and some from the Spanish War too, I believe, that were reinterred here. We're at Dr. Um, Richard Jordan Gatling, he invented the Gatling gun.
What is the Gatling gun? It is a machine gun, the first machine gun, and it is the war machine. Oh, okay, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting. Won many wars because of that gun. Killed a lot of people. It's kind of uh, weird how this guy invented a gun like that. Uh, but, um, you know, there's always uh, good, but a lot of bad when it comes to war. War is hell. That is true. We're here at the top of Crown Hill, the tallest place in Indianapolis. and Indianapolis is a flat city, I'm guessing. Not many mountains, huh? No, no mountains here. Okay, so you can see downtown uh, pretty good right there. And if you see right there, isn't that where the uh, Colts play football at the yes. stadium right there? Okay. Or okay. Sainsbury here. Yeah, right next to that one building right in the center. That's the place where the Colts play. And uh, who is this that we're walking up to? James Whitcomb Riley. He's the creator of Orphan Annie. Orphan Annie. So he wrote the whole movie? Yeah. Or the the, play? Yeah. He, um, he's a book. He was a writer and a poet. Okay. I seen that movie when I was a little kid. Uh, we almost got thrown out because during a movie I couldn't be quiet. I was a talkative young little lad of a kid. I remember somewhat seeing this movie. Favorite is Daddy Warbucks. This is not his original burial site. He was um, buried somewhere else and they removed two unknown people from this spot just to bury him here. They re Wait, they removed two people that were previously, buried, previously here. buried here to bury him here. Why is that? They, um, just that they. I guess he wanted, wanted to. Spot I guess he wanted to be the at the tallest point in all of Indianapolis. Well, actually, he was. Um, this was gifted to him. Um, they actually raised money to have this memorial built. But uh, yeah, they did remove people just to put somebody else here. So you're not guaranteed a spot <laughs> just because you. Yeah, pay for nothing it. is guaranteed, even in death. Yep. We're here at Thomas Benford. Um, this man was a pioneer in civil rights, and he also um, helped with the 500. Mr. Benford was a great man. Yeah, but off the camera, you did say, it's, <laughs> hey, listen, listen, it's okay on my channel. Freedom of speech is very paramount. You, you had a, a bone to pick with this man, so you told me that you were a well, manicurist? I was a manicurist. Yes, I was at the Indianapolis Athletic Club, and he was my client. Um, he didn't have the great, greatest grooming habits, but he was a nice person, and he did tip, so. He tipped really good. Yes. J but JC, when he came in, his hair was a little, uh. Yeah, he didn't wash mm. his hair. Well, hey, we all fall short to the glory yeah. of oh, yeah. cleanliness, so. But no, this guy was a great man, and he, uh, he fought uh, for a lot of people's uh, civil rights. Uh, mm -hmm. What, back in the 60s, huh? Mm-hmm. All right. Great man. This is Kyle Michael Keltner. Um, he died in a car accident and his parents lobbied and passed a law to where we have to have child safety seats and use them in our vehicles today. Yeah, and because of him, I guess, back before you had to be a toddler, now they made it more stringent that uh, even if your kid is seven or eight, they have to be in some kind of a booster seat mm -hmm. um, until they meet the required height and weight and what have you. And this was donated. Uh, Crown Hill donated this plot to him. Okay, very sad. Game, set, match. Uh, this is the grave of Stan Malice, December 17th, 1914 to January 19th, 2012. He was born in Chicago, moved with his family to Indianapolis when he was five years of age. Uh, very, very intelligent person, this kid got a scholarship to Purdue University at the age of 15. Uh, how many people can say that? Uh, he owned a couple Indy cars here in the 60s. Uh, very wealthy guy. Uh, and he he had a company that uh, built magnets, right? Yes, for the lunar mission. He's the first uh, the first vehicles on the moon. Okay. Magnets. So, you've, yeah, you invented magnets uh, for the lunar vehicles. Do you believe that we landed on the moon or do you think that's a hoax? Mm. A lot of people say that we've never landed on the moon. I don't know. I believe we did. I don't know. It's uh, no, hopeful. Well, well that's going to be hopeful. a future vlog where I'm going to investigate that. But anyways, his magnets were on the moon, as the story goes. And also, this man was a uh, an entrepreneur, a humanitarian. He traveled many, many countries. And when he was 89 years old, he actually traveled to a place that very few uh, 
any of us will ever be able to go to, and that's the South Pole. Mm -hmm. And we're not allowed to go to the South Pole because there's it costs so much money and resources and time when people get stuck out there. But there's another reason why we're not allowed at the South Pole. I will get into that story another time. And if you uh, hate boring tennis matches on TV, you can blame this guy. He he had he got the first. Match. Now people might feel a little bit uh, offended that you just said that tennis was boring because I myself I enjoy a bit of tennis. Uh, I, I'm more into the women tennis than the men's tennis. Well, you know when you interrupt Days of Our Lives, we get kind of upset. <laughs> a, a, fan, just a, a, a fantastic. Uh, a fantastic soap opera that my mother used to make me <laughs> watch yes, with her. Exactly. And I could not wait for that show to be over so I could watch cartoons. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, a great man, lived to be 97 years of age, uh, lived a fantastic life, uh, you know, lived a life of uh, few people would ever get to uh, experience. And uh, just a solid stand up guy, to say the least. Stan Malice, right here. We're at Robert Ursay's grave. He's the owner of the Colts. He was the owner of the Colts. Um, he also briefly owned the Los Angeles Rams, who are my football team. Uh, I'm not a Raider fan no longer just because I get tired of them losing all the time. <laughs> and uh, this is his second wife uh, that he's lying in rest next to, Nancy Ursay. Uh, he had a first wife. Her name was... Harriet. And, uh, yeah... She's buried down the way there a little bit. Um, they had three children together. One of his kids tragically died in a car accident in Chicago. Her name was Roberta Ursay. And a very beloved man. Uh, you know, you uh, look up the history of Indianapolis uh, with people who have contributed to Indianapolis society and a very beloved man, to say the least, uh, here, Robert Ur Ursay, the owner of the Indianapolis Colts. Hopefully one day they'll win another Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. We're here at the Body Donation Memorial. Uh, these are the cremated remains of people that have been um, donated their body to science. After they are done, they are cremated. The family has the choice of picking up their ashes or they are interred here. Now this is a very uh interesting that you used to be a mortuary tech so you've done the embalmings of people who have donated yes. their body to science yes, i have and um yes it's very interesting what um, what, what difference uh is it in the embalming process with somebody who donates their body to science versus somebody who's just you know for a normal burial well, we take um all hair and anything that is identifiable off the body um not tattoos but we um, make them totally unrecognizable. Okay, so why do they do that? Uh, you, you said like when women donate their bodies, you shave their heads, all, all their body hair. Mm -hmm. So well, why why do they do that? So the doctor doesn't feel like relating it to a human. Um, apparently they think doctors may get scared if they... If they recognize the person or... or so uh, so, so basically, so they, they try to make the body look as unidentifiable and look the same as everybody else yes so they don't yes and they no longer have a name they get a number to track them and uh, now you can track your loved ones and find out where they went sometimes um, you know um, it's very interesting they have a funeral here once a year where they bury uh, the unclaimed remains very interesting Andrew Compton of Caramel, Indiana, left us on October 28, 2010 to be with his heavenly father and those who had gone before him. He died in Louisville, Kentucky, where he was attending Sullivan University. He was studying culinary arts with aspirations of becoming a chef. Andrew was born on February 17, 1992 in Indianapolis, Indiana to John and Angela Compton. He grew up in Caramel, where he attended Forestdale Elementary and graduated from Caramel High School in May of 2010. Andrew loved all animals and had a passion for cooking. He was particularly fond of desserts. Andrew was a quiet, sweet, kind, trusting, laid back, friendly, lovable kid. Andrew may have been quiet in public, but he had a glowing personality and shined. Now, for those watching, you might wanna skip the rest of this 
part of the video because this is going to be a little bit graphic. Andrew here was uh, murdered on October 28th of 2010. Uh, at the time when he was in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, depends on what story you want to believe, but the story goes as follows. He was on a gay dating website and met a man by the name of Gregory O'Brien, 40 years of age. According to Gregory O'Brien's story, the two met up, had sex, and during the course of sex, he states that Andrew died and that he believes he suffered a broken neck. So instead of calling the police or calling the paramedics, uh, he takes this poor boy's body, stuffs it in a TV box and takes it out to the landfill. Andrew was missing for quite some time. Some detective work finally came back, traced the murder to O'Brien. Uh, they did a search warrant on his house and there was blood there and whatever evidence he tried to cover up failed miserably because you spray some luminol and of course uh, under a black light the uh, blood will glow and that's what happened over there originally they had offered him a plea deal uh, he denied the plea deal and they went to seek the death penalty and Eventually, they came to him with a better deal. He got 25 years in prison. Now, I know that that's not much and that there is a very good chance that Gregory O'Brien will someday get out of prison. And the reason why he only got the 25 years and they just didn't go ahead with the death penalty or at least with life in prison is because Andrew's body has never been found uh, this grave is empty. I, I tried to look up as much as I could, but um, as of two years after his murder, his body had never been recovered. Um, they thought they had might found some flesh at the dump site, uh, but uh, no body has ever been uh, recovered. This is Daniel D. Mahorny, 1949 to 1971. He's buried alongside of his father, uh, Thomas Mahorny. Uh, he had won the uh, an air medal and the bronze star. He was a helicopter mechanic and a gunner. He served 18 months in Vietnam and came home and was visiting some friends in Phoenix, Arizona, walking down the street and he collapsed and died. That's all it says, it doesn't say the cause. Melissa Golzer, March 31st, 1961, August 12th, 1996. Mom, we love you, we miss you, we wish you were here. Mother's Day, 1997, Megan and Will. Melissa was a flight attendant for American Airlines for 13 years. Uh, she is a graduate from Florida State and it just says online that the cause of her death was undetermined. Lucille W. Nally, 1928 to 1948. Uh, Lucille died, it was either February 26th or 27th of 1948. She was 19 years of age. She was getting off the bus uh, from work on her way home and according to an eyewitness, uh, a car just driving down the street. She walked right in front of him uh, at a high rate of speed and she hit the windshield and rolled over the car. And she was taken to the hospital where she later passed away. Uh, she left behind a husband, uh, both of her parents and a one-year-old baby.
Patricia Fisher Greased, beloved wife, mother, and sister, December 27th, 1950 to November 15th, 1989. Uh, in her obituary, it says that uh, any contributions could be made to the Lupus Foundation of Indianapolis. We're here at Marjorie Viola Jackson. Um, she's the heiress of Standard Grocery. The chain of grocery stores here in Indianapolis from back in the 70s and 60s. She was murdered in her home. And her home was set on fire late after, after they took $9 million. Yeah, she was a very eccentric woman. I'm actually going to probably more than likely be doing a vlog about this lady's story because it's very interesting and it's more so than just like stopping by her grave uh she her husband uh started standard grocery which is a chain of grocery outlet stores here in indianapolis uh he was very wealthy and he let her he left her several million dollars and um I, I, an employee was stealing from her she found out through like a forensic uh bank records analysis so she withdrew all of her money uh, out of the bank and hid it in her home. She hid it in vacuum cleaner bags, uh, suitcases, in her clothes, in her dressers. Uh, I mean, anywhere that she could hide the money, it was ridiculous. And I guess word got out that uh, she had all kinds of uh, crazy money in her home and she was robbed. Um, the people that were responsible for the murder uh, were eventually arrested, tried and convicted. Um, one of them died in prison and, uh, they did recover some of the money, but, uh, a lot of it just disappeared. In a couch, they recovered the money from a... How much was in the couch? Um, uh, several million dollars they found. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I feel very, very awful for this lady because you said that you were telling me before that she was a very nice lady. She was very generous and, and um... I uh, heard from um, a friend that um, she actually would tip $100 bills to the grocery delivery men. She was eccentric and didn't leave her house much, but anybody that helped her, she she was very generous. Yeah, yeah I, I'm i going to do a vlog in the very near future about this woman because th this story is just obviously it's going to be a lot more than I could just say in the two and a half minutes that I stopped by here. but. Uh, yeah, look for that video sometime in the near future. This is Braxton Kirk Ford, December 3rd, 1998 to February 5th, 2020. On that night, uh, February 5th, 2020, he was at an apartment complex with a couple of his friends here in Indianapolis when someone pulled out with a gun and started shooting him and along with three other people were murdered. Very young man and to have his life cut short like that, he was also an Eagle Scout too. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. The scout law has 12 points. Each is a goal for every scout. A scout tries to live up to that law every day. It is not always easy to do, but a scout always tries. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent be reverent towards god be faithful in your religious duties and also respect the belief of others okay that concludes the video i want to thank my very special guest mary here for showing us around the cemetery here in indianapolis live but not live but still alive by the grace of god i am lamont at large with mary coming to you from the crown hill cemetery in Indianapolis, Indiana. Come visit. For sure. Have a good day, guys. God bless. Peace out.